All right, welcome back. Now, what we've been looking at um, previously is looking at um, radioactivity and radioactive decay. Good? And in discussion, we realized that um, this process cannot be um, predicted. Good? And what we can, um, there's some bit of information that we can find out that the rate of decay is not affected by external conditions such as um, increase in temperature, increase in pressure, decrease in temperature, decrease in pressure, um, per se. Good? However, um, with some bit of knowledge, we can use to um, determine a bit of an approximate time over which um, something can decay and also it can lead to other bit, um, major factors or of, of different material. All right? Um, some terms that we want um, that we're going to be looking at that we need to be aware of, aware of is, um, for instance, the activity, where the activity of a sample is the rate of decay of its nuclei, meaning it's the number of nuclei that decay each second. All right. So when we hear the term activity, it is talking about the number of um, nuclei that decay each second, and in you realize that um, the SI unit of activity is Beckwell's, right? So the symbol B, capital B, common Q, right? BQ um, for, um, as the SI unit. Good. Now, what we're going to actually be moving into um, today, which is part of the syllabus, is looking at um, half life, radioactive decay and half life, right? So I have a is a definition of half-life where well, you see that um, half-life is the time taken all right that's one of the first part that we must notice for this definition it is the time taken to do either one or two all right so th this is the second half of the definition either number one or number two so it is the time taken for the activity of a given sample to decay to half of its original value that is one that's one definition that we must know right so the time taken for the activity as i previously mentioned is the the amount of nuclei that decay per second right so it is the time taken for the activity of a sample to decay to half of its original value and secondly it can be otherwise stated as the time taken for the mass of a sample to decay to half of its original value so in this case is the mass right so those are two different definitions for the term half-life and the purpose of half-life is basically to help to determine the time in, um, time in which something is going to decay or break down good now for instance um some um we want to figure out the one of the things in answering any half-life question is first and foremost to determine how many half-lives would have occurred in a given time frame. That's the first thing you need to know in order to answer any half-life question. And to, um, to, to help, uh, help you with that bit of knowledge, um, there's a table that relates to the number of half-lives that occur to the fraction of the sample that will remain. So remember, this is looking at a given amount of sample, that the sample has to be the same size, all right? So, we want to relate the number of half-lives that would have occurred to the fraction of the sample that remains, as in how much of the undecayed material, uh, the undecayed matter remains. So, we have a table here, which it shows the number of half-lives that, that have occurred compared to the fraction of the sample remaining. Good? So, what it shows here is that if no half-lives would have occurred, that the whole sample is still remaining, one. If the first half-life occurred, then only a half of the sample remains. Only one half of the sample remains there. So we end up with one over two. Good? If a second half-life occurred, then it is half of the half that is going to remain. And a half of a half is one quarter. Good? Then, the third half-life were to occur, then it will be half of a quarter. A half of a quarter is 
one eighth. Good? One eighth is going to remain. So what you want to realize in the pattern here is that the, the sample keeps reducing by half of the amount that is remaining that was there before. So from one goes down to a half, then a half of a half is a quarter, a half of a quarter is one eighth. Then a half of one eighth for the next half life is going to be one sixteenth. And then for the next half life following is going to be half of one sixteenth, which is one thirty two. Good? Then we could keep going down. Right? Now, what we have here is a formula that can help to determine the fraction of the sample remaining, where n represents the number of half lives. So we can substitute this, substitute the number of half lives into this formula to find the fraction of the sample remaining. And we're going to see that this table helps us in, um, in terms of answering any question related, related to half life, first and foremost. So remember the first thing that we always must do with a, a half life question is firstly to find out how many half lives would have occurred. So in this table, the number of half lives implies the fraction of sample remaining. And therefore, the fraction of sample remaining also implies the number of half lives that would have occurred. Right. So we have a question here that we want to answer. All right. Now it says, this, this question is a, a question from your CXC paper 2014, May 2014, number 6. Right. Um, there's, a, there's a part of the question we're going to look at as it relates to half-life. It says, in 20 days, the activity of a sample of bismuth decreases to 1 16th of its original activity. Calculate the half-life of bismuth. All right. Now, as I always say, one thing to look for in a question is look for the values that are stated. Right? So it gives you the fraction of the sample remaining. And it says the fraction of the sample remaining is 1 16th. Good. That is what is remaining. So if we know the fraction, we can therefore determine how many half lives occurred, right? By saying, by finding n. And given max, there's many ways you can work it out. We know that a half to the fourth power is going to be equal to 116. A half to the fourth power. So n is equal to 4. Right? So that's the first thing we do. We have to first define how many half lives occurred. And we found that four half life four half lives occurred. Now, once we find how many half lives occurred, the question wants us to find the half life. Right? The half life. We want to know what is the time frame. Now the question tells us that in 20 days it falls down to 116. Good? So it means that four half lives occurred in 20 days. So therefore, we want to know what is the time frame for one half life. So now, there's an introduction of another formula I want you to get. Right. That the total time is equal to the number of half lives multiplied by the half life. Good? So the total time given, which was 20 days. 20 days. The number of half lives that we found out is 4 times the half life. So when we rearrange this notation, we get that half life is equal to 20 over 4, which is five days. Good? So that the half-life is five days. 
all right now this is one way of doing a question by creating by the use of the given formulas all right another way we could we could use um how to solve any question is by using a, a flowchart method right So we have a question here. It says a radioisotope gives a count rate of 50 Beckwells. Determine the count rate after 40 years if the half-life is 20 years. Right? If the half-life is 20 years. So we want to know what is the count rate after 40 years if its half-life is 20 years. So as I mentioned, the first thing we always have to determine is how many half-lives would have occurred in the time frame, right? So our time frame there is 40 years. Good, so we want to know how many half-lives occurred in 40 years. So if the half-life is 20 years, how many 20 years would you get in 40 years? Good, so we're going to look at the flowchart method. And what we're going to see here is that we start that, that the activity that we'll be starting at. The activity we start at is 50 Beckwells. Good. And after the first half life, it is going to go to half of its sample, which is 25. So this red arrow represents a half-life that occurred, and this half-life took a period of 20 years. Good? So 20 years occurred here. So the next half-life is where this is going to decrease by half again. And half of 25 is... 12.5 backwards. Good? And this half life also occurred in another 20 years. So, which is a total of 40 years. Good? So, we're going to see two half lives occurred. Right? Two half lives occurred, and this is the activity after 40 years. And this therefore answers your question. Right? So, the activity after 40 years is. 12.5 backwards. Good? There's another way we could have done it. We could have found out how many half lives would have occurred and realized that the half lives would have occurred there is two. Two half lives would have occurred in the 40 years and once the half life is two, then the fraction remaining should be a quarter, the fraction of the sample remaining should be a quarter, so a quarter of 50 is going to be 12.5. A quarter of 50 is equal to 12.5 backwards. So this is the other way in which you can solve your half-life questions, right? In terms of using a flowchart method, and then in terms of using a formula right so any question you pick up you, i want you to try this method and see if you could have um if you can solve these questions if you have any issues be sure to message right and at this point you make sure like and subscribe and share with your other friends your other classmates and so forth thank you for tuning in again